folks seemed way more serious about this whole thing. I think all we need to do now is just get a little bit of that seriousness and we could be sitting pretty pretty nice place. Yeah, we, we have the ability to improve access and maintain access beyond what we probably even imagine. We just got to commit to it. And we got to say, this is what we're going to do. Well, welcome everyone to uh, another episode in our third season of Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. We have a special guest today that I think many of you will recognize. This gentleman has been making a career of hunting on public land, do-it-yourself hunting, which most of us can uh, easily understand because that's what most of us do. And uh, this gentleman has some really great insights. He's done a lot of research and study over the years on how to be effective with public land hunting. And he's got some definite ideas on where we need to go in maintaining our rights to hunt as well as our opportunities to hunt. And of course, I am speaking of Randy Newberg. Randy, welcome oh. to the show. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate you having me. Dang, it's been a long what? time since you and I got to talk. I think, was that a trade show a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, the last time you and Betsy and I got to visit? So, Yeah, I think that's about right. How have you been doing in the meantime? Oh, I've been doing great. You know, I, I've been, I've been uh, what do they call it, isolating out in the woods for <laughs> 100, 120 days a year. So can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the great way to handle the COVID epidemic. <laughs> uh, uh, Shoot. Uh, thank, we did thanks something for similar. Yeah, thanks oh, for having me. Appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm really looking forward to discussing some of the public land issues with you. But I think before we go there, Randy, let, just in case there are one or two people out there who don't know who you are, could you give <laughs> us a quick little fill in on your history? Uh, yeah, I'll try. Uh, yeah, I live in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, been I'm sorry. In this, <laughs> yeah, I know that's what most people say now. Uh, <laughs> we uh, we've been producing our content here for we're going into our 16th season. We started wow. out as a platform called On Your Own Adventures. Now it's called Fresh Tracks. Uh, as part of that, now we used to be on TV, and we moved everything over to YouTube, and we have two podcasts, all the normal social media, and all that stuff. And uh, so. It's been a great place to to build from in my real life. I'm a tax accountant. Uh, a CPA, <laughs> Sorry again. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people say, Randy, how did you make that leap from being a tax accountant to being this outdoor person? And I don't know that I have a good answer to that. It just, like a lot of things in life, it just happened. So, uh, <laughs> but when, when I moved to Montana 32 years ago, my life has always been about hunting and it's been about public lands and conservation. And so that's what I focused on when I moved here. And as being involved as a volunteer and involved in a lot of conservation work, I said, all right, how do I get more volume to the cause of conservation and hunting on public lands and, and the things that a lot of people, it, it's their only chance to hunt. And so that's when I came up with the idea that, well, maybe I'll try this. And here we are. So, oh, yeah, that's really great. You must have quite a following. Do you have any numbers on how many follow your YouTube adventures now? Oh, uh, I should know all that. We're close to a quarter of a million YouTube subscribers. Uh, you can? And I, I didn't, this is, a, can, can I just admit this right away, Ron, so the embarrassment of it? I know so little about Facebook and Instagram that I have these crew that work for me that are all in their <laughs> 20s and 30s. <laughs> They're the ones who do all that. So I should know yeah. what those numbers are, but I don't. Uh, if you asked me to post something on Instagram, I'd say just a second, and I'd had my, hand my phone to one of my crew members. Uh, so <laughs> I love I, it. I, I should know all that stuff, but I don't. Uh, we, we have a, a podcast called Hunt Talk, another one called Elk Talk, and then I have a really large online forum called hunttalk.com. So hey. those are the places where I spend most of my time. Great. And where can uh, people find that just by searching yep. what you've just mentioned? Yeah. Yep. Huh. Great. All that All will right. show up. Th thanks to Google, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, I w used to do a little hunting TV and it was always difficult to find places to hunt and especially on public land and yep. you're able to pull that off. How do you get away? Cause I can remember back well, way back when trying to do some public land hunting and then a TV show and I got all this hassle from the government about filling out forms and 
how many helicopters are going to use to make this movie? And <laughs> I no, didn't even we, know we had a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we still do the same thing. There, there are film permits that are required. Uh, the compliance rate is really low, but my theory is if I'm the public land guy, I got to be following every, you know, checking every box. So uh-huh. uh, I was doing the math on this because somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago how much I've spent in public land film permits in my 15 years of doing this. And oh it's boy. come to a little over $220,000 of public land film permits I've paid. And oh, my gosh. I, you know, we also have to carry liability insurance for up to $3 million in case me or my crew start a forest fire out there and all that stuff. So mm. that adds about another $4,000 a year. But you know what? We have these public lands. I'm using them, and I should have to pay for for the right to use them, just like someone who's grazing or mining or timber or oil and gas. You know, everybody who... Other than the general public, everyone who uses these public lands pays for the use of them. And I, I, some people get worked up about that. I, I really don't. I just wish they were a little more, uh, consistent in how they apply these yeah. rules. Like one forest in Montana might have a completely different set of rules than a forest in Idaho or a forest in Utah. And so yep. it's, <laughs> we, we, we think it's difficult to keep track of hunting regulations in 50 different states. Well, there's seven, I think it's 76 different forest districts in the West. And I got to keep track of the film permit rules for all of them. So, oh, uh, my Lord. Uh, so it's, uh, it's part of the deal, but you know what? It kind of weeds out, if you want to call it competition, also. Most yeah. people are like, I'm not going to mess with that. And so they don't. Well, that's what I did. I just wasn't going to mess with it. I yeah. just went and found private ranches and big places to go because it was yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's, and then the, probably the other complication is that uh if you get permitted in some area of your hunting district and the elk migrated because of weather over to a different part if you didn't get permitted for that part of the district you're out of luck so <laughs> I, I had a hunt in wyoming and i'm like they, ne- they never go over to that mountain range so i'm being a cheapskate right i want to save some money so i only get permitted for about half the unit and a big blizzard comes, and all I could do is just watch the elk over on the other part of the unit. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah. But. That's the kind of static I don't need in my life. It's complicated enough. I mean, it is hard enough to find your animals on public land, especially, and then have to be limited by this permit system to boot. You have got a tough road to hoe, my friend. Uh, well, you know what? That also forces us to be better or try to be better at telling true stories. Um, uh-huh. you and I, you and I have been in this long enough. We know that it's hard to tell a real compelling story when it's slow, right? Yeah. Whether you're writing an article, whether you're doing a, a piece of video, but if you work at it hard, there's usually a story about the people or the species or the landscape. There are stories out there. And to me, those are the fun things that I really enjoy are telling these stories that maybe uh-huh. people didn't know about. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's definitely the way to go. Authenticity really works in this business because we're talking to people who know what we're talking about by and large. (laughs) They've been there, done that. And when you try to blow some smoke up their skirt, they can tell real quick. Yeah. They they definitely can weed you out. If if you're a faker, (laughs) you're going to get called out in a hurry in the hunting space. Yeah, absolutely. And and deservedly so you bet. Yeah. Say Randy, you know, a lot of my, uh, viewers and fans are really into cartridges and rifles and i've not noticed that you focus all that much on the ballistic end of it like i do but i think people would still be interested in considering all the hunting you've done for all the different species a little bit about which rifles and cartridges and bullets you prefer if you could go there for us i'd love to hear it yeah well i have this buddy ron and another buddy wayne that when i get into that stuff i usually google them and ron spomer's (laughs) name shows up but uh uh, I've been all over the map on that. You know, I look at my, my gun safes. I think I've got over 50 long guns in there to choose from multiple, uh, models of diff- of the same cartridge or the same, you know, chambering, but <laughs> this might be reflective of my age. I have been like this boomerang child who went out and explored everything. And I came back to the old 308. Uh, I, I know that's not real sexy and I get a lot of people who tell me you can't kill an elk with a 308. Oh, really? Uh, I got a bunch of elk that went through my freezer that didn't get the memo. Uh, so I, 
I would say yeah. that, oh, uh, that, that's just where I gravitate to. If I'm hunting bigger things like elk, I'm going to go with the 30 caliber and it's usually my 308. I do have some 300 wind mags. I'm pretty, pretty, I'd say attached to when it's smaller game like deer or pronghorn, uh, my seven MM08 is my go-to, but a couple of years ago, I got a 6.5 PRC. And, you know, everyone's got to have some bad, you know, some distraction, <laughs> some diversion in life. So I would say my 6.5 PRC is probably my new uh, diversion from my old boring way of, of doing things. But I, I don't know. I, I'm always more convinced that my equipment is way more capable than I am. And I get to practice a lot. Uh -huh. And for me, if I practice a lot, that 308 is gonna do the job every time yeah just, well so. a lot of my listeners are going to enjoy those comments because they're pretty familiar with me dissing the 308 i've pr pretty <laughs> consistently pick on that one <laughs> ah, ah good <laughs> i understand that it can it can pretty much do anything the 30 out six can do and the 30 out six can pretty much do anything the 300 wind mag can do and you know it's the right, right. bullet in the right place but still if you start digging into the ballistics, you can always find something negative about that little 308 being a little bit underpowered. So I sort of yep. pick on it on purpose just to get people riled up. <laughs> no, I, I, I get that, you know, and for me, I, one thing I have determined is if I'm going to be out hunting, I'm not going to try to save a couple extra bucks by buying the cheapest ammo on the shelf. Yeah, right? that's smart. And, and you and I, we get shipped ammo from companies and stuff, but. I've tried every quality of ammo, every type of ammo out there and super quality premium bullets. There's a reason why they're worth it because in <laughs> any cartridge, they perform the way they're designed to perform. And yeah. uh, I'm, that's one place where I won't give up is I, I'm not going to go and, you know, buy whatever's the cheapest thing on the shelf just because that's the cheapest thing on the shelf. And yeah, that's it's that, how and I it's really false. It. Yeah, it's really false economy too. Yeah, I hear this from so many guys who say, "Oh, I just get the cheapest yeah. stuff out there. It all it's all the same. It all works just great." Well, yeah. probably not, or they would not waste their time inventing these new bullets and trying <laughs> to improve on the performance that some people didn't think worked all that great. <laughs> yeah, but then yeah. you know to squander a few bucks on a bullet or a cartridge when you spent all that money on your tags and your rifles and your scopes and your binoculars and your range finders and your truck. And by the time you get yep. to the bullet, it's like throwaway. Who wouldn't yep. drop 10 bucks on the one thing that's going to do all the work? Yep. That's the bullet. Yep. So yeah, yep. you're, you're a wise I, man to use good quality <laughs> ammunition. I, I tell people I spill more coffee on the floor of my truck in a season than what the price of quality ammo cost me. So <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking deep on this subject. <laughs> All right. So yeah. now that you're out in the field, you've identified yep. the public land on which you want to hunt. You've gotten yep. the government's permission after you've given them a whole bunch of cash. Yep. So you can actually go and hunt. You've got your rifle and your top notch quality <laughs> ammunition and bullet. Yep. Do you have any other challenges out in the field? Yeah. Lots. What's the Lots. biggest problem with public land hunting these days? Um, boy, the biggest, uh, you know, a lot of people say competition, right? So mm -hmm. I do a lot of articles, a lot of videos about how to use, uh, hunting pressure and how to anticipate it and how to use that as to your advantage, because mm -hmm. these elk respond to hunting pressure and they respond in somewhat predictable ways. So how do you use that, whether it's the days of the week you hunt, the time of the day you hunt, how far back you get, how, you know, do you use llamas? Do you use, you know, what, what do you do? Do you use horses? There's a whole bunch of things where in my mind, hunting pressure. Yeah. It's we're, we've all been there, right? You're set up and you're thinking, oh boy, it's, they're going to be coming through. And all of a sudden you hear some guys walking and talking. It's like, oh, dang it. Uh, mm -hmm. It just happens on public land. I accept it as part of the drill. But for me, I I think the biggest challenge that most hunters face is they aren't students of elk hunting and uh, of elk themselves, I should say. So 
they see elk in August that are on a food pattern and they think, oh boy, when season opens in late October, that's where I'm going. I saw those ones in August up there. Mm -hmm. Well, in late October, the elk are on a completely different behavior. There's something else driving that behavior. It's probably hunting pressure. So they're not going to be up where you saw them eight miles further south. So I've written all these articles where I break elk hunting down into five calendar periods. It's the early season, the pre-rut, the peak rut, the post-rut, and the late season. And elk behave differently in all five of those periods. They have different needs in each of those five periods. So if you know what the need is for elk in your area in that calendar period, then you know where to go and find them on that day that you're hunting them. So I, I just think too many elk hunters, and I know I'm focusing on elk here, but they spend too much time fishing where there aren't any fish. You know, <laughs> you, you, you got to have some fish around in order to be successful. So. <laughs> now there's a novel concept, hunt where the elk are, huh? Yeah. And I, I, here's this, this gets to be, some people give me a little grief about this, but I say, eliminate where they aren't so you can focus on where they are. And if you yeah. look at a, a digital map or a paper map of a unit out West, it's intimidating for a lot of people. They're like, well, where are they going to be? Well, we walk through processes of how you can eliminate two thirds of the unit or three fourths of the unit. So spend your five or seven days focusing on the other parts of the unit where they're most likely to be. And okay. so, uh, I, I'd, I'd say that's one of the biggest challenges is they've seen videos. They think, oh, you just go sit in this big, beautiful park and elk walk through it. Well, that might happen if you're really lucky, but in most instances, that's not the case. So I, I think we've trained audiences and readers and viewers to maybe have some false ideas about what public land elk hunting is. And we try to give people tools and information to get a little bit better at it. Yeah. Now tools and information would definitely include some of these mapping programs. And oh, I've yeah. got mixed feelings, mixed feelings on this mapping stuff. And I'm sure <laughs> you know all about those. You hear from people and you know it yourself. How yep. has that contributed to the increased pressure on public land? This, this ability for average hunters or even someone who's never hunted elk before to use some of these mapping programs and study the techniques that you teach, for instance, and improves their chances. And does that then drive more competition? Oh yeah. I mean, of my, well, let's see, I've been hunting now for 45, a little over 45 years. The most revolutionary thing to hunting in my lifetime has been digital maps. Right. Okay. We all, uh, do you still have file cabinets full of old surface maps like I do, Ron? Oh, I still love them. I <laughs> just have them. I, I can't bring myself to get rid of them because over on the margin, I got highlighter marks in purple and green and blue yeah. and old, old phone numbers of taxidermists or, you know, whatever. And I can't throw them out, but I, you know, everybody's got one of these, right? A cell phone. Yeah. You got digital maps on these. There is nothing that has changed the face of hunting, at least in the West, more than digital maps. Because that hey. little spot that we used to know about because we knew the forester and the forester said, oh, yeah, actually, where that road goes, sir, those two, those two public parcels actually touch. And you couldn't quite tell on this big surface map. Well, right. now people know that. Or, oh, okay. yeah, there's an easement across this. Yeah. Well, before you used to kind of have that as your own little proprietary intellectual property, not <laughs> anymore. Everybody yeah. has it. There are no places that are public that the world doesn't know about. And that's, yeah. that's been the game changer in public land hunting in my lifetime. Yeah. And I've certainly noticed that. And it sort of depresses me because uh, the way we did it in the old days was boot leather and we just put a lot of work and time into it and making calls to certain people who knew the area maybe a little better than you, but it was a lot of work. And once yeah. you've compiled that work, you felt pretty superior because you had this inside information that not everyone else did. And now it sort of ticks me off <laughs> that some novice can come in there and from the seat of his pants, staying at home, he can learn more in about an hour than I've learned in the last 10 years about an area. Yeah. Drives me crazy. The, my crew will comment uh, and they'll say, is there a forest person, forest service or BLM person you don't know? Well, there are, but that was our relationships back in the day, right? 
you wanted yep. to know that range con who worked for the BLM because they knew a lot about the access as much as they knew about the range conditions and the yeah. same with the forest service person. And so I now, you know, over time, everybody starts retiring and, uh, all my contacts, not all, but most of them have retired. And yeah, I'll admit I've replaced them with this device. Um, yeah, everyone else is doing it. And so it's, yeah, it is what it is, but I, I think tech technology in that sense has been the game changer on public land hunting. Yeah. So what is the downside to that? You know, it's for the individual hunter who uses it effectively and gets his game. Wonderful. You know, this is just a whole wonderful thing, but there's gotta be a downside. And I have some ideas yeah. on what that is, but I'd like to hear what yours are. What are the oh, downsides yeah. of this increased access and the new tools that help us be more successful at finding game and taking game? Yeah. If, if you're like me and you had this one little pullout area that you'd cross a little creek and head up the mountain, well, guess what? You show up there one morning and all of a sudden six other guys have this same device. And now what was my, what I thought was my little secret spot the world would never find out about, boom, they are there. You also end up with way more pressure on public land because it's way easier to sit at your computer and do all this analysis than it is to go out and make relationships with private landowners and gain private access the way that it used to be done. You know, now private access is mostly a function of writing a check, but there used to be a lot of this. You know, I'll just, you know, I'll get to know the landowner. He'll let me walk across or whatever. And that's changed. So the crowding, in other words, the number of hunters per acre, if you want to call it that, um, on public land, I think has gotten higher, even if, you know, if everything else has stayed the same. That results in more pressure on public land. And the more pressure we put on public land, where do those elk and deer go in response to pressure? Mm -hmm. They go to the private places. So <laughs> I, it, it creates its whole set of, of complicated uh, dynamics that, that weren't there yeah. prior to that. So, Well, getting to the heart of the issue then, what does all of this pr- increased pressure and changes in the system, it, it's got, as I see it, at least two major effects. One of them, of course, is it's harder to draw a tag in most places. It just seems like there are more people scrambling to to draw fewer tags. And then the other yep. is what is the conservation, um, issue? Uh, are, are we actually potentially hurting our game populations with this sort of hunting pressure or is that being handled by tag al- allocation by the biologists? Yeah, that's the good question. And that varies by state. Like my home state of Montana, we issue statutorily, we have to issue 17,000 non-resident deer and elk tags. If there were only two deer left in Montana and five elk left in Montana, we still have to issue 17,000. So (laughs) it's easy money. Yeah. In some (laughs) states, the biologists, their hands are a little bit tied. Uh, But I look to Wyoming, you know, they had that really hard winter this year. They're really adjusting tag numbers. Arizona and Nevada had a really bad drought from 2018 to 21. And they adjusted tag numbers. Now it's kind of flatlining and with moisture, hopefully they'll come back up. So. I think we can rely on some of those state agencies to do that at times. Um, the other part of it is we're, we have a smaller resource. The population of the United States in the last, I think since 1980 has grown by a hundred million people. That's more people out on the woods, out on the trails. That's more habitat that's been usurped to, you know, subdivision to human development. So our herd numbers are not as robust as they were. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 yeah. years ago. And so for me, I always try to add this conservation message. And some people think I'm being a bit facetious when I say, if you want to double your odds to draw a whatever tag, elk tag, deer tag, have twice as many animals on the mountain. And that comes with conservation. That comes with productive landscapes. That comes with funding. Yeah. That comes with research. And they look at me like, well, I'd rather just fight over what's left. They don't say that, but you can tell that in their response that, well, conservation, that's hard work. That, that takes time. Yeah. Yep. It does. And you know truth? what? It's, it, it's what got us here. And if we're going to move past some of these constraints in the funnel, we feel that feel as, as 
populations, wildlife populations shrink. The only thing that's going to get us through that is by building bigger herds, bigger numbers. And conservation is never cheap. And it's going to be more expensive tomorrow than it is today. And it's going to be more expensive 10 years from now than it is today. So we just got to accept that and, and roll our sleeves up and do the hard work on that. And that's why in our content, we always try to talk about the conservation aspects because that is really what drives it all. Yeah. Yes, Randy, I have certainly noticed this. You know, when I was a, a kid growing up, we were looking at increasing populations of big game because, of course, we'd, we were probably only 50, 60 years into the North American management program of conservation in which hunters, by and large, put out the funds, the political pressure, and all the interest was driven by hunters who started these programs that restored elk and whitetail and Canada geese and turkeys and you name it. Most of the big yep. game species that blossomed during the latter half of the 20th century were because of conservation hunters. But I don't know. I seem to think what we've gotten spoiled and we've got now a couple of generations who just assume this is the way it always was and always will be. And I yep. think we've got somehow to get these folks to start understanding they need to have as much interest and pay as much attention to conservation and biology and all the rest of it, even the political issues uh, governing public land as well as private land and the population issue that you brought up. You need to pay as much attention to that as you do your technology, your guns and your gear and all that fun stuff. Yep. And we, this is the time of year when tags in the West, all the states are having their tag drawing. And mm -hmm. I get inundated with the emails and the comments of, see, you've given all this information and now it's more popular and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't draw my tag. No, I get that, you know, and I explained to him, I used to draw a pronghorn tag in my favorite part of Wyoming just about every year. Why? Mm -hmm. Because at the time, Wyoming had over 750,000 pronghorn. After this winter, Wyoming's probably going to have less than 350,000 pronghorn. So. Yeah. Do you think it's easier to draw a tag when there's 150% more animals out there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, and, and that's, people will say, well, that's 20 years ago, right? That 20 years in the, in the time of, of what conservation happens is not that long of a window. So no, we got to no. get back to doing that. The other thing we got to get back to is working on public access. And when I say public yeah. access, I'm not just talking about access to public lands. I'm talking about these state programs that reward landowners for access to private lands. Mm -hmm. Because in a country that's two-thirds private, the access component to private lands is critical to hunting. And we, we got to work on that. We, we ever, I think too often we just say, well, that's the state's job. Well, that's the agency's job. Yeah, it is, but it's all of our job. And yeah. If people don't have a place to hunt and we're losing, you know, a hunting ground at a rapid pace on private land, it just creates more crowding on the remaining uh, uh, land, whether it's remaining public or private that's accessible. And that damages <laughs> what most people would say is their experience out there. So it's not going to be easy. And all of this takes money. It takes time. It takes work. But imagine if... If the folks back in the 1930s, when they came up with Pittman Robertson, when they came up with the Waterfowl and Duck Stamp Act and all that stuff, mm -hmm. what if they mm -hmm. would have said, oh, that's just too damn hard. I, I'm not doing that. Heck with that. Yeah. Where would we be today? And this yeah. is the message I try to get to people is somebody built this and somebody made hard decisions and someone put their shoulder to the wheel and funded this. This well, like you asked, do they think this just happened by accident? Have we taken it for granted? I think we have. I think we've forgotten mm -hmm. some of these stories. We've lost the context of how much work so many people put into this process to get what we enjoy today. And if we're not willing to do the same collectively and individually, well, it's, it's going to change and it's going to change to the negative. Yeah. How, Randy, how do you successfully approach that with your communications? I've always wrestled with this. I'll know if, if I do an article or a blog or some sort of a YouTube on conservation or wildlife or 
biology, try to make it interesting. I even wrote a book once that called it The Rut, and it was all about why our big game animals do what they do during the rut. Why the elk bugle? I mean, if I had 30 girls in a herd, I wouldn't be screaming to the world to come and get them. <laughs> so what's yeah. going on there, you know? <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but understanding that stuff, I don't get nearly the audience that I get if I, re- if I would instead write about a cartridge or a bullet. And then I'll get oh. 10, 20 times more responses to it. How do you get that important, critically important information out there so that people pay attention and do what needs to be done to rebuild these populations of game and protecting the, the habitat, both on private land as well as on public land? You know, issues like how, what are your grazing permits for forests? I've gone into some forests looking for elk. And you're lucky to find some grass there because of all the cattle. It's obviously got too many cattle on it. And that's always been a contentious issue in the West. I'm not saying that cattle grazers are the the ultimate evil, but they're like anything else. There are always some bad actors in there. And the same, I think, goes for the government forest service managers who wink, nod, let that sort of thing happen. You know, I've known several of them over the years who say, oh, yeah, it's pretty standard around here that if you give a, a gentleman an allotment on a public land area for 100 cattle, he'll slip in another 50 and nobody will notice. Wink, wink sort of thing. And it's been going on for a long time. But issues like that, how do we deal with it? How do we get hunters concerned to be involved in the same thing without turning them off? That's one I am struggling with every day, Ron. I, I'm like it, you. If, if I do a video that says Randy Newberg misses a big bull elk, and I put it on YouTube, within two days, it's going to have 80 to 100,000 views. But if I did a video that said, hey, you know, here's how you can contribute your time, your talent, or your treasure to the cause of elk conservation, I'd be lucky if I got 4,000 videos in a month. Uh, I, I really struggle with that. We produce those videos and those that content anyhow because it's part of our mission of what, what our business is set up for. But yeah. I, I'm really at a loss for how do you make conservation, science, biology, how do you make that interesting to the audience? We've had some successes. We've had some, made some big investments of time and money and doing films about people groups of people who go out and install water uh, catchments for wildlife. I thought, boy, this is going to be a big hit. And who can't love these guys? You know, blue-collar, hard-working folk, nobody watches it. Now, if yeah. I said, you know, shot big Colorado buck, boom, it, you know, just be overwhelmed. So I, I wonder, the, the, I think collectively over time, we have train the hunting audience in their mindset away from the importance of conservation. And it's going to take some time to get that back. I don't know if it can be brought back, but when people are way more concerned about fighting over the last elk tag or the last pronghorn tag, rather than putting more elk or pronghorn out in the hills, it's an indicator to me that we've done something a skew in our messaging. And I don't know where it happened. I can't attribute it right. to just one event. But I know when I was growing up, the mentors in my community, when they said, hey, we're going to go all volunteer for this tree planting thing, you know, we're going to stop some erosion or we're going to build yeah. grouse habitat or we're going to this or that. Boy, everybody went and did it. And mm-hmm. now you look at how many hunters we have and how few of them actually participate in conservation activities. It's like, dang. You know, we, we don't have enough shoulders against the wheel relative to how many people are wanting, wanting to ride in the wagon. So, yeah, I wonder, I wonder how much of our general society, our general culture's emphasis on the individual and I got mine through you, you get yours contributes to that. I think a couple of generations have just grown up thinking that they deserve everything. They, they get a blue ribbon for showing up. So why shouldn't they get every elk tag they want and they should get the biggest one and to heck with anybody else. And why should I work for it? Because it's just out there and it's public and by golly, I want mine first. I think that's got to have a significant. I I think it does, Ron. And uh, I, the thing I always remind myself when I get frustrated or feel that I'm missing the bigger picture is that hunters are a cross section of our larger society. 
So if yeah. our larger society shows certain trends, certain behaviors, certain tendencies, it's kind of foolish for us to think that the hunting community would be any different than that. So I think a lot of those things that we observe as a changing society, those play out in the hunting space. They might play out in a different way in the hunting space, but they're definitely present. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing, Randy, is that technology is so easy to come by for a want to be hunter and much more easy to eat than habitat or places. You're living in suburbia, you're living in the city, you, you're not in Montana, but that's where your dream is. You want to go out there and hunt an elk. Well, you can't really go out, hike the mountain and find the elk, but you can stay home and play with your digital tools. You can buy the new sexy rifle because, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to get close enough to that elk since I've never seen one before or seen the place I'm going to hunt them before. So I'm going to get a rifle that can drop them at a thousand yards and then I'm going to get a big scope and then I'm going to get the anemometer to measure the wind speed and I'm going to, you, you name it. They're into the technology because it's more accessible. Land right. on which to hunt, not so easy. Right. Ron, when, when we were younger, say in the 1980s, would we have ever dreamt that there would become industries built around uh, applying for your tags for you? You just send them a list and they say, yeah, we'll apply for all these for you. You sign the power of attorney. They'll help yeah. you book your hunt. They'll help you select all your gear. They'll buy your gear for you. They'll, it's like, all I got to do is just show up and pull the trigger. And I, yeah. I know for some people, it's like, look, that, that's a more efficient use of my time and my money. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm yeah. not criticizing that. I'm just saying, yeah. would we have ever seen that or, or dreamt of yeah. that to give some context to how much things change in society and they change in hunting the same way? And yeah, we're, you know, I, I think when it comes to technology, we as hunters have to start asking ourselves, can the resource sustain the amount of pressure that we want to put on that resource with the technology that is now in our hands? Yeah. That, you know, I always respond to that, Randy, by saying, look, fish and game can protect the resource through the allocation of licenses and tags and stuff. Yep. If you have a million people vying for a thousand tags, it's no different on the harvest level than a thousand people vying for those thousand tags. So yep. that's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue for me is, do we only, do we want to have only a thousand tags? Wouldn't we rather have a hundred thousand tags, which means we need more habitat so we can have more yep. elk, more mule deer, more pronghorn, more everything. That's yep. the big problem or the big concern. And that's what we're driving at. And, and to direct, direct this conversation into a more positive direction. What can hunters do other than buy the latest and greatest tools to make an easier shot? What can we do to increase those populations of the wildlife that we love? Yeah. And, uh, I tell people the things you can do, just understand they're not easy. They're going to take some time. They're not convenient. They're going to happen at difficult times in your calendar, in your daily life. And there's going to be some discomfort because whatever you advocate for, for wildlife, someone's going to have a differing opinion. So. It might be something of going to a legislature and asking the legislature to listen to the science rather than the, the social policy issues. Maybe yeah. it's going to your game and fish meetings when they have season settings or they, they're building a new elk plan or a new deer plan or a new other type of plan. Uh, it's joining conservation groups as much as people will say, oh, well, they don't spend the money in my backyard. No, maybe they don't, but they're probably in your state or federal legislature advocating for policies, advocating for funding. Uh, you know, may, some people are just aren't into group stuff. So maybe they're just going to do it themselves and not be part of a group. And, and that's fine. I just tell people, find a passion you have and find a way to make that place and that landscape and that species better for you and for those who will come after you. And that requires usually time or talent or treasure. I, I call them the three T's. Treasure is, is money. Some people, none of us have time, talent, and treasure, right? It seems like the people with the most money have the less, least amount of time, or the people with the most amount of time have the least amount of money. Or, right? Whatever you have, give something towards that cause beyond just buying a license and paying your excise taxes. Yeah, That's what our, our predecessors did that, Ron. They did a lot of work that we, I, I know growing up, I saw it, but it didn't register with me, but now I see the benefits of what they were doing. And they weren't just buying a license and calling it good. 
They were volunteering. Yeah. They were doing things. There were private landowners leaving a little bit in for the pheasants or for the deer, or, you know, somebody building wood bo- uh, wooden boxes for waterfowl nesting or, you know, some guys mm-hmm. were real serious about trapping skunks and raccoons because the nesting birds were, I mean, there was yeah. always somebody who was thinking beyond just, well, I bought my license and that's good. Yeah. So I, I wish I had the, the easy answer for that though. It's, yeah. uh. You know, but what what you were just touching on with the funding and all and buying your license, we can definitely take some pride in knowing that Pittman Robertson funds our 11% excise tax on the guns and ammo we buy goes to wildlife habitat. That's a big deal, a huge deal. Yep. And so are your tag fees for game wardens and running your game departments and the biologists and everything else and the disease research that goes on. All these wonderful things that are going on behind the scenes, we do contribute to, but as you said, you got to do more than just buy that license and tag. You really do need to get involved. And for me, it was always my passion for wildlife and wild places. You know, I, I was as interested in, if not more interested in the wildlife itself as the tools and techniques for hunting that animal. So I've always enjoyed it year round. I will be the one who's going out and building the wood duck nesting boxes and and planting trees, oh my gosh, over my lifetime, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of trees I've planted. I just planted three more yesterday. <laughs> but not everybody's got pr- a ground on which they can plant trees. But as you said, there, there's a way to get involved. And yep. something that I have really noticed in the last several years that really encourages me is that I can go back to South Dakota and Kansas and Nebraska and a lot of the places I hunted years and years and years ago and find new places to hunt. Big, vast farms that used to be shut down or overgrown, well, overrun with cattle or a bean field or something. And now they're rife with wildlife habitat because the landowner passed away and he gave that land to fish and game to manage as a wildlife resource. It's really impressive. I mean, thousands and thousands of acres. And then in the programs you uh, alluded to earlier, the walk-in areas, public, uh, private lands that are then open to the public by using some of the licensed dollars to pay the landowner to make it accessible. Those things are yep. opening up a lot of ground for hunting. And you combine that with federal programs like Conservation Reserve to put more grass out there. That has done wonders for many species of wildlife. Those are the kinds yep. of things we need to celebrate and to continue. And I think that's where we need to educate the average hunter so that he understands what potential he has for influencing that kind of habitat and improvement because oh my gosh does that increase for instance the pheasant population in south dakota yep. it was in the toilet in the mid-70s and after crp came in my gosh you go back there now instead of a million pheasants in the state they had something like 20 million <laughs> pheasants <laughs> yeah and you know you, you do let's use crp as kind of an example crp doesn't just benefit pheasants it benefits native species like sage grouse, like sharp tail and deer. Some of the best deer hunts I have in the high plains <laughs> country is in CRP ground. And it, yeah. it slows erosion. It slows other things. It helps wetlands. It, so just using that one program, I, I like using that very often as an example about here's okay. a policy thing that it's really not costing you as an individual, you know, you're not writing a check. Yeah, it's coming out of the federal treasury. And, uh, it's, it's creating huge benefits. It's benefits for private landowners, it's benefits for wildlife, and it's benefits for those of us who love wildlife. So how do we keep things like that going? How do we keep those state access programs going? You know, there, there's things that we can do. And I think Americans, we've become kind of trained as our knee jerk reaction. And this is as the tax accountant, right? I'm, I'm saying this, that raising my hand as guilty that as quick as we hear about another government fee, it's like, oh, great. Now you're going to blow it on something else. But, yeah, you know, I use it as an example. I pay $20 for my elk tag in Montana as a resident. That's almost embarrassing. $20 yeah. and I get 11 weeks or six weeks of archery, five weeks of rifle and 10 days of muzzleloader on that tag. Really? Come on. <laughs> Uh, it's it's embarrassing to think I get that much entertainment, that that much pleasure, that much food, if I'm lucky enough to get one for 20 bucks. So I think there's times where we're going to have to start asking ourselves, are we paying 
a proportionate share to what we're getting back out of it. And let's quit asking the other guy to pay for it all. Like in Montana, we ask non-residents to pay almost a thousand bucks. So a 50 to one ratio, really? Come on. Uh And all your Montana listeners are going to be like, hey, Ron, give me Newberg's address. I'm going to go over there and put a (laughs) knot on his head. But my point of saying that is conservation doesn't happen with bake sales and, you know, shelling flowers in front of the grocery store. It happens with real money. This happens on land, expensive land that could be used for other productive purposes. We got to be in that game. And if we as hunters want to complain every time there's a fee increase, every time we're asked to pay a little more, we're probably going to end up with what we asked for. Not much. Yeah, you know, and, and we also have to realize that we're in competition with all the other land uses out there. Somebody wants to turn it into a wind farm or solar panels. You've seen some of these solar farms. Those yeah. things are taking up square miles of habitat, fencing them yeah. off so the migrations can go through. And oh, new roads for oil development, logging, suburban developments. I mean, houses popping yep. up in places where I used to hunt. Years ago, friends and I went out quail hunting and we went to each individual's pre- favorite places. I think we went yeah. to something like nine or seven different places where we all used to find lots of quail and there were only two that were not developed. They wow. converted all of that land that was wildlife habitat and huntable into housing developments or some other kind of a development that did not have wildlife on it anymore. So if we do not start preserving, improving, increasing wildlife habitat, If you think the tags are hard to come by now, give it another 10 years. Yep, absolutely. And that's just a fact that I I think it's news that people don't want to hear. But I think uh, this is where I feel a responsibility as someone who has media platform. It's my job to sometimes say what people don't want to hear. And in this case, it's we got to do more. We have to try harder or we're not going to have the habitat base and the land base to support the number of animals that we want to have. Uh-huh. And that's, that's just you know, a, an equation. They're, they're, that's not me making this up. That's yeah. reality. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty basic. Yeah. So. Well, you know, I applaud you for what you're doing, Randy. And I'll, to be perfectly honest, I can understand folks who say, Guys like Randy and Meat Eater and Spomer and everybody else who does these hunting shows and tells you how to go out and be more successful, you're contributing to the problem of too many com- competitors for the same tag, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, I think me as Stuart, to a degree, we probably have contributed, but I think we're also contributing to general knowledge and improvement and respect and ethical yeah. standards and all the rest of it. I don't know too many folks with platforms like ours who don't advocate for some aspect of responsible behavior and doing it the right way. I think hunters today are, are so much more ethical than they were back when I was a kid, when it was, you know, wink, wink, well, we, you know, jumped the fence and got it and old Sam will never know we were there. Ha ha. And yeah. ah, we don't really need a tag. Well, we just use grandma's tag. <laughs> Grandma doesn't hunt, but we can get another tag and all, you know, all the games that they would play. These yep. days... Folks seem way more serious about this whole thing. I think all we need to do now is just get a little bit of that seriousness and onto the habitat and conservation into the program, and we could be sitting pretty pretty nice place. Yeah, we we have the ability to improve access and maintain access beyond what we probably even imagine. We just got to commit to it, and we got to say this is what we're going to do. And yeah, so but I appreciate you having me on. And, uh, I hope that next time I'm, uh, around your neighborhood that I have time to stop. And yeah. Yeah. Just, stop in and, and we'll show you the habitat improvements around here and introduce you to some Colombian sharp-tailed grouse. Yeah. I've, I've been watching those out on some of your social media platforms, Ron. I, I, I admitted that I don't know how to post anything, but I do occasionally <laughs> scroll through there and it. Uh, you, you are one of those people who I, I do follow. So I I appreciate appreciate it. You and Betsy do. You guys are, are really good at, at putting a message out there that's worthwhile. Uh, I know that if I see something that has your name on it, it's not going to be a waste of my time. It's not going to be some self-promotion of, you know, look at me, I'm Ron Spalmer. It's going to be something useful for people. And I, 
I think we need more of that and less of the look at me sort of stuff. So I hope you keep doing what you're doing. Well, I appreciate that, Randy. And I could just turn around and say the same to you, but you've already said it. So just flip the names for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Randy, this, this was a great conversation, uh, quite, um, educational really. And, and I hope inspirational folks, I hope you listen to what Randy has to say here, because this man really, he's out there and he sees what's going on and he sees it over the years. So there's a lot of wisdom in here. It's just not a one-off thing. And when, when he sees certain trends happening, you can appreciate what he's telling you. And his message, I think is spot on. We all need to be much more concerned about our public land access, our public land habitat conditions, the condition that it is in. Um, we've got to pay attention to all of this stuff. And when we do that, we are still going to be able to have fun using all of the wonderful new tools and rifles and bullets and scopes and everything else that we've got. So we're just going to have more opportunities. And that's kind of the key. We need to maintain the, the wonderful wild lands that we all know and love. And then we're able to utilize them as a, a natural predator involved with nature as was intended, like every other animal out there. You got to eat something that was once alive and, and being a hunter and getting it for yourself is a great way to do it. So yeah. Randy, until next time, we're going to touch base with you again down the road. And you're going to tell us about a couple million new acres of habitat that are open for hunting and how we can get a tag. Uh, I'd love to do that, Ron. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hey folks, thanks for listening in. If you have any questions for me, uh, and or Randy, you can find Randy on all of his sites. He's listed them earlier. We'll put some notes here for you. I think my team can probably do that so you can find him more easily. And of course, you can always find me at ronspomeroutdoors.com. Send in your comments. Let us know what you think about these very serious issues about wildlife numbers and, and habitats and accessibility to the land that we all own and love. Until next time, this is Ron Spomer for Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast on Honest and Shoot Straight.